Welcome back to The People's Basics, where we come once again to celebrate our movement for the universal basics of income, services, and rights. We're here to do yet another Commoner's Corner segment where we try to talk to you, the members of the community, a vast you know, ideological swath of what are the basics that we need to be establishing and how do we achieve that. And so for today on the program, we've brought on Merrick DeVille to be able to talk about what her top issues are and how we address our dysfunctional system. So with that being said, let me bring Merrick onto the program now. Okay, Merrick, welcome to The People's Basics. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're quite welcome. So Merrick, for those who aren't aware of yourself, who haven't been following you online uh, like I have, you know, can you introduce yourself to some of the folks out there, you know, where you're from, what you do, and how you politically identify? Yeah, yeah. I am a uh, lefty sex worker, um, sex worker advocate, um, I guess just progressive advocate um, down in Texas. Um, I mostly am active on Twitter, but I also make um, some pre-made YouTube videos. Sometimes I stream that sort of thing. Okay, that's awesome. So, you know, there are so many flavors of left out there. So when we talk left, I'd love to hear in your you know mind, what is that basic responsibility that the government has to its people? How do you kind of identify within that circle? Do you think it's, you know, beneficial to be identifying with these like, uh, you know, very specific ideologies? H how do you identify there? So, see, that's that's interesting. When I first joined um, leftist spheres and when I was first interested in leftism, um, I identified very strongly as an anarchist because um, I have seen a lot of ways in which our government is currently broken. Um, so it really made sense to me initially, like, you know what? It's not working. It seems like there's a lot of abuse of power. It seems like there's a lot of functions of government that are broken. Um, so I kind of thought, you know what? It seems like it's always very rife for abuse. Um, but the more that I've read and the more that I've been in, in lefty circles and the more I've learned about like specific policy and especially more about local politics, um, the more that I start to think that just because there are aspects of government that are broken now doesn't mean that we necessarily would be able to function well without one. Um, so now I've moved in a direction where um, I'm very interested in market socialism. Um, and I'm very interested in the idea of um, trying to add more genuine democracy in the way our government functions. And I do believe that because we have this societal contract that we essentially enter in when we choose to live together, um, that we do have a responsibility to each other. And the best way to go about that is having um, an actual organized structure that takes care of certain things. Like, I liked having <laughs> paved roads. You know, I've lived in places without paved roads. Yeah. I like them. <laughs> um, I like having a fire department. I like having EMS. Um, I would like for us to have health care. Um, you know, I would like for us to have um, a unified electric grid, because I don't know if you guys remember this, but back in January, we had that polar vortex hit the, yes. uh, the middle of the country. And down in Texas, I don't know if you guys know this, but Texas has a separate electric grid from the rest of the country. And the reason that we did that, well, I say we, the reason that politicians did that was that they didn't want to have... Um, federal regulations and um, I guess federal oversight on our electric grid. So things like that have really shown me that um, I think the ideas that I had about, about anarchism are not necessarily ones that I um, hold now. So I do think that our government has a responsibility to, to take care of us and things like that. And I do want to see, um, you know, more nationalization of utilities and things like, like that. Um, <clears throat> because I just think that things would run more smoothly. So I, I do believe that the government has an obligation to us, especially because so many of us pay out the nose in taxes. Um, and I would like to see our tax dollars go to reinvesting in our lives and coming back and taking care of us. Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting dynamic of like the filling of the void of what is currently organizing so many of these current practices where you have to ask yourself there's either a power vacuum or no one, you know, regulating a corporate entity from simply having cost cutting measures to reduce, you know, certain prices, which is this interesting dynamic of how much government intervention do you want to have? 
in a bad form of government, you obviously don't want to keep increasing an inefficient government that's, you know, bloated and corrupted. But like, I, I do believe we can have this method of communally working together to have an efficient government that provides basic services and basic income for us all. I think it's a reasonable conversation of what does basic really entail? And we could talk about that. But I think you're right that it's really interesting of like, well, you start to see the implications and we have a sizable Texas audience. My co-host on our other program is from Texas herself. And so, you know, a lot of people were impacted by that decision to in-house these things. And so I have to wonder, in your opinion, what were some of those moments? Was it this January that kind of was that flip for yourself? Like, like I've seen a lot of drift, frankly, in left circles, I think more towards anarchy through the 2020 cycle. I think it's been more attractive because they felt, OK, we've ended up with Biden again. We've ended up with Trump again. I think they feel like there's this growing just general dissatisfaction. What do you try to tell people when you believe that you can actually make government work more efficiently? The people who believe that government inherently is just too corrupted to its core. So this isn't necessarily something that I've been particularly vocal about. Um, it's been more of like a, a personal journey for me. Um, I, you know, I don't really know how you would go about like arguing with someone on that because I, I think that anarchists come from this very good place of um, wanting to get rid of hierarchy because they genuinely believe in um you know, eliminating human suffering. And I think, you know, that was what was really appealing to me, right, was this idea that hierarchy creates oppression. Um, and I think the thing that someone said to me that that really started to change my mind about it was, listen, um, it doesn't have to be about oppression if you add, like, real democracy into it. Because I don't necessarily believe that we have real democracy in this country. Um, we have, yeah. <laughs> like... Nobody wanted Joe Biden. We all know that nobody wanted Joe Biden, but that's who the Democrats stuck us with. Um, and I think we all know in this country that uh, corporations are more important than all of us. Like, I don't really think that that's much of a secret for most people. So someone phrased it to me, uh, this idea of like, if you want us to proceed forward in a way where the standard of living for the most people rises um, to the the most degree possible, you there's kind of like a certain amount of complete and total freedom, I guess, that you trade in for a rising standard of living. And I, I don't know that that's necessarily a perfect way to phrase it, but I think this idea of like complete and total freedom is in like not having any government, not having any regulations. Like I think that's more the point that was made. And and the more I thought about it, the more I was it, it it really seemed to be um, pretty pretty reasonable, I guess, to me because you know I I also see the amount of like infighting and the degree to which it's really hard to get people to come together and actually organize and actually work on something. Um, I think structure tends to actually be really good for people, and it just seems like. It, it it just seems to me that a lot of um, if people are moving in a direction where they're they're more interested in anarchy, I, I think it, that might be because of um, almost this sense of like disillusionment. But but I don't think that we have to see things that way, right? Like I don't think that we necessarily have to um, forego these ideas of organizational structures when really we could just go, okay, how do we make this better? How do we make this more efficient? Um, how do we work from the ground up to build something that actually serves the people? I mean, if you look at, are you familiar with how the Coke network um, sort of built and like astroturfed and built these like synthetic grassroots organizations yeah. and how they, yeah, and how, how they essentially went and they put, they donated to colleges. So they got institutions to teach their specific programs to college kids. You know, they, they went and they poured hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of dollars into local races. Um, I think we could be doing similar things like that too, where instead of just completely destroying everything it is that we have that works, 
Um, I think that what we should be doing is trying to invest in the things that we have right now that we know work and we know raise a standard of living um, and try to create progressivism literally from the ground up. Yeah, no, I fully agree with that general notion that when we are trying to invest into our people, use A, the proven solutions, and B, when you are fighting against a system that has all these things against us, whether it be the general indoctrination of a media bias of who has the general ownership of these groups, well, now a lot of the times it's more the telecom companies that are now controlling a lot of the media networks. We've had this consolidation within the media. You have these general, frankly, we've moved towards a little bit more of a democratic system in some ways because of how the party structures have worked. Instead of the parties just directly picking it, we at least get the the uh, process of democracy of getting to vote for our <laughs> candidates. Whether or not it is influenced through that, that is to be said in certain parts, we can question that. But I think in general, we have been moving as a trend in society towards more and more democratization. And I think you're right, the natural progression is going to be continuing to democratize society. And that can be things like direct democracy measures, whether that be ballot initiatives that we've had in certain states for certain measures, that can be collectivized to the federal level. It could be things such as just general democracy reform and how we vote and how we finance campaigns. There's so much to be done. And I really do believe that is like the linchpin and so, you know, I, I just ask you, this is obviously one of the hardest problems in all of politics. When the system is working for people to stay in power because it is designed in such that they've won the game at one point, they've gotten into the inside, how do you make them want to change the rules kind of against themselves in a way to bring power back to the people, have a more fair democratic process? Uh, I don't, I don't know that. Man, I, I want to have like some bright, cheery answer for you, but I, I don't I don't know that you do. I mean, if we're if we're talking about like the kind of people who are willing to do anything, right? The kind of people who are willing to um, seize what should be actual democracy and give us only the illusion of it. The kind of people who are willing to rig our system. The kind of people who are willing to run mega corporations that screw over everyone else that are destroying our environment. Um, I don't think you get those people to just go, okay, well, I guess we'll just do it differently now. Like, we'll just abandon all of our investments. Like, I, I don't think that that happens. Um, but I do think that we still have mechanics in is, this country and in our, you know, form of government to where um, I think we can just kind of outvote them. And I think that we can just kind of um, build something bigger and build something better. And I think that it comes from modeling our strategies after what they did. Um, and I think a lot of that is just sheer numbers. And now we're never going to have the financing that the Coke network has, but I think that we have something better, which is numbers. <laughs> um, there's a lot more people in this country who are progressive. And I genuinely believe that um, local politics is so important. And I don't see, um, at least in the sections of Twitter that I'm in, in the sections of like leftist spaces that I'm in, I don't see enough discussion of how do we build firm strong foundations in our local areas and build up from there. I really think that that is the only way that we begin to change things. Um, like if you, if you look for instance in Texas, we just passed the heartbeat abortion ban. Are you familiar? I have heard of that. Yeah. So, we so for the people, yeah. So for the people who are not familiar, um, basically Republicans in Texas are taking electrical activity that happens at six weeks into a pregnancy and saying that that's a heartbeat and that that's sentience and they have officially banned abortion past six weeks. Now, almost no women know they're pregnant before six weeks. It just, it just almost doesn't happen. So this is effectively an abortion ban. This was passed with the Texas Senate, the Texas House, um, and, and these are things that like we can change this on a local level. Um, and when we start to change things from the ground up, um, I think 
over time. This doesn't happen tomorrow. It doesn't happen in five years. It doesn't happen in 10 years. It's a slow process. But I think over time, we can turn the tides. Um, and over time, we can slowly make progress. So by the time we're talking about changing the system entirely, it's not going to be like, how do we overthrow these corporations? Or how do we get these people to abandon their interests? It's, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts, right? So we chip away at the base of power that they have and we make change slowly yeah I and mean, i know that's not sexy but <laughs> that's it might one be of the me. that's one of the hard realities that i think yeah. a lot of the progressive movement sometimes struggles with uh understanding sometimes like a we have a couple of factors that are on our side like if it comes to just generational change like when eventually the gerontocracy that currently occupies Congress finally ends up retiring or dying, uh, there is going to be a generational shift that is going to be towards our favor. But oh, yeah. all of these power movements have come from the ground up when it comes to advocacy. And so I think we do need to be embracing so much more of this kind of local focus. And I think 2021, maybe people are feeling a little hungry and left over from the 2020, uh, you know, <laughs> Oh God, that was that was a brutal year for a lot of people, just gauntlet. But if you can recharge yourself and get involved, uh, I highly encourage you start to study how your state politics and your local politics work. We've certainly been getting involved. I'm in like the New York City area, so we've had a lot of excuse to kind of cover that race. But I highly encourage you all to get involved into your local politics. But um, you know, Merrick, I had one more question that I wanted to ask you. You said that you work within the sex industry and mm -hmm. want to advocate in that space. I just want to ask you more generically, what do you think is the help that the people working within that industry need? I don't want to presuppose specific issues. What, in your opinion, are the hot button issues that your community is working on? Um, I think that we need more attention put towards the repeal of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, specifically regarding us. Um, that is the uh, the pivotal point of FOSTA and SESTA. Um, if y'all are not familiar with FOSTA and SESTA, that's the Fight Online Sex Traffickers Act and the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act. Um, and those were uh, passed in 2018, and it has pushed a lot of sex workers offline and onto the streets. It's pushed sex workers into the arms of pimps, traffickers. It's made it harder to find evidence of children who are actually being trafficked. Um, it's made it harder to prosecute people who actually traffic children. Um, and it is sort of like Trump was talking a lot. Oh, hi. <laughs> Trump was talking a lot about uh, repealing Section 230, which would be uh, devastating for online political discourse. Um, instead of trying to instead of trying to fight off lawsuits constantly, we just wouldn't be able to talk about controversial things anymore. So I think like paying attention to these sorts of things, bothering your representatives, learning more about sex workers' issues. Um, there's a whole slew of legislation that's affecting us. There's the Earn It Act. There's, um, I think it's SISA. It's, I, I never know how to pronounce it, but it's S-I-S-E-A. And it's this new proposal that's going through where they would require all social media to be fully staffed 24 seven with call centers that the social media have to pay on their dime. And the call centers are for, oh yeah, that's never gonna happen. So, so, <laughs> yeah, I can't even work, man. Oh yeah, oh so so basically the, the idea would be that, um, if you are, if you find revenge porn of yourself, you can report it to these call centers and they have to have it taken down within two hours. Now that sounds great, but they also create two lists, one of people who perform and one of people who have had um, victim, that have been victimized by revenge porn and you can be in one or the other. And if oh, you're in one, geez. you're never allowed to appear in any sort of pornographic yeah, film ever. And who, so who is people, the most likely to have that happen to them, frankly? It's sex workers. Yep. Yeah. So um, it's it's a really, really devastating law that they're trying to push through, which could potentially um, end the ability of sex workers to do online sex work thus pushing them even further back onto the streets. Prostitution arrests will rise, deaths will rise, overdoses yeah. will rise. Um, and, and it just... Uh, it lines the pockets of the for-profit uh, prison corporations. So it's it's just a really bad situation all around. Um, and the thing that you can do if you want to help sex workers is learn about this legislation and bother the shit out of... Excuse me, I don't know if I can... <laughs> yeah, no, you can. <laughs> bother your representatives. Call them, email them, annoy them. Follow sex work... Well... 
learn about to your sex discretion. work online yeah. to your discretion. Um, yeah. You know, listen to what we have to say about the things that affect us. Yeah, no, I think that does make a, a lot of sense in terms of just, you know, the way we can help people kind of be safer within a practice is kind of take it out of the shadows. One mm-hmm. of the big things that we like to preach in general is, you know, ending certain prohibitions because yes. I think it is a method that harms people when generally victimist crimes. And I feel like this is an obvious one. I feel like this may be oversimplified, but you know, the porn industry is a legal practice. Uh, it's regulated. There's stuff around that. Sex work is that minus some of the cameras at times. And so I always wonder why we have that kind of like dynamic where it's like, okay, if you want to commercialize this and let someone else sell your body for you, okay fine. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. But if you want to do it for yourself, God forbid. Um, but I had one more question on that same subject. Mm-hmm. Do you believe it should be something where it's decriminalized or legalized? I know there's kind of this dynamic of within the industry, should it be kind of regulated? Do you have any final opinions on that? So I, I used to be a major proponent of decriminalization. And I think with with our government being where it is and with public opinion being where it is now, I understand why decriminalization makes sense. Um, A lot of sex workers do not trust police. Um, I don't trust police. And I think that there's really good historical precedent and really good reason for that. Um, That being said, I think in a perfect world, in an ideal society, we would have regulation in that we would make sure that the girls are safe, well, it's not just girls, actually. It's There's all kinds of people yeah. in sex work, so I, I shouldn't say that. But um, and, and when I say sex work should be legalized, I mean full service, because sex work is actually an umbrella term that encompasses exotic dance, porn, mm-hmm. OnlyFans, um, uh, phone sex operators, all kinds of people. But when we're talking about full service, I think in a perfect world, there would be uh, regulation, and it would be make sure that the girls are safe. It would make sure that there's security. It would make sure that brothels are not able to take 50% of your earnings because where how it stands right now, brothels can take 50, 55%. And then the girls also have to turn around and pay taxes on the 50% that they get to keep. So, I mean, your effective tax rate is, I don't know the math offhand, but something insane. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think as it stands right now, decriminalization would be a really good first step because we also don't want to end up in a situation where the poorest of the poor people who are turning to sex work out of desperation are getting essentially screwed over because they can't afford the license or because yeah. they can't afford the doctor visits or they don't have health care and they can't get tested. So, the, you know, then they go to jail. And so I think de- decriminalization right now is the proper first step. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. There's going to have to be some level of a transitionary period. I think we have to embrace that a lot of policies, when it's a big idea of trying to make a big change in society, that it takes, you know, some steps in between. People hate the notion of incrementalism, but I I think it's like you take a win and then you try and get another win. Like, you're not satisfied by one win. You want to aim bigger. You ask for bigger because you know so often when you ask for something bigger, they're going to water it down anyway. Uh, So, like, I agree that we should be trying to take those transitionary steps. Uh, Merrick, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with our audience today? Or, you know, we always love to have our guests, you know, at our final question. Do you want to turn the tables around and ask me a question to wrap up? Um. Yeah. Okay. So I I guess final thoughts are, um, please, if you are not interested or involved in local politics, please get involved. It is so much more important than you realize. Um, And yeah. Okay, John, I I do have a question for you. What what made you think to do this? Because you you mentioned something that I thought was really interesting was that you talk to people all across the political spectrum. I kind of had the impression that this was just like a lefty show. So like what inspired you? to Yeah. Well, because I think in general, people have a common basic. We can all recognize common needs that we have in our own life and we can debate the level of what a basic standard should be for society. But I think we can all have that common ideal that that is what we're striving for. Obviously, some might want more for themselves, but I don't believe that should be a limiting thing. And so in order to gain a coalition and rally support around these ideas, 
I don't want to shelter myself off. There's obviously limits. I'm not going to be necessarily trying to platform Nazis in particular. There, there are certain okay. subgroups Solid. that I may not <laughs> like want exactly, but like for the most part, I try to be relatively tolerant for the most mm -hmm. part. If you are willing to be someone who is generally respecting of humanity, like I have a rule, like, you know, you could be in the same beliefs as me policy wise. But if you're just an absolute like asshole and I just don't want to even associate with you, like I'm just not going to spend my time with you. Sometimes you just got to value genuine people, people who are like genuinely good people who you can work with on a lot of issues that are worth spending your time with. And I think we have to be more open to letting people in. We don't always have to move to them. We can stay firm in our beliefs of what we advocate for, but like, how do you bring more people into your ideas? You just keep saying it to the same people over and over. It's like, yeah, if we keep saying it to the same people, of course we're going to win finally. I, I want to finally win. I want to have these ideas actually get across the finish line. And how do you do that? You have to be willing to talk to a wide variety of people and bring people in. This is literally contact theory. You're completely correct. That's very cool. I'd yeah, love to see it. I mean, that's generally how I think we're going to win at the end of the day. If you believe in your ideas, you shouldn't be afraid of talking to people about them. And guess what? Yeah. Maybe you aren't right. You should be humble enough to accept sometimes you're wrong. And through the exchange, you'll learn something. Oh, I think I'm wrong we all need the time. To yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so that's I cool. feel like we need to just be more open. And so, you know, Merrick, I'm so glad we got to talk. I love to be able to bring more people in and hear their perspective and their issues. So thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Bye, guys. Okay, everyone. So that was Merrick DeVille. You can go check out some more of the information that we're going to be including down in the description below. Uh, but that being said, you'll also see in the description section below some of our information. So please come join the network. You'll find all of our social media pages. You'll find our mailbag section if you want to send us a question for our podcast. Uh, you'll find the ability for you to sign up to come on this show to have an interview like we just did with Merrick today. And also, finally, as we wrap up today, I want to remind you all, please hit that subscribe button. We're really trying to push our goals uh, to hit that 2,000 mark. We're going to give you a little karaoke at that point. And then if we hit 3,000, uh, we have an interview upcoming with Paperboy Prince. Uh, we're going to give you some of that for free, but we have some bonus content from that of some special questions that you'll want to see. So if you hit us to 3,000, we'll release that video as well. So please Come help us share the movement for the universal basics here at the People's Basics by subscribing and sharing today's video with others. That being said, my friends, I hope you have a great day out there, my universal people. And as always, I hope you guys stay classy.